Good evening. I'm Dr. Andrew LaBarbera, Chief Scientific Officer of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Welcome to the 15th presentation of the ASRM Grand Rounds webinar series. These twice monthly webinars are designed to address topics in the ABOG Guide to Learning in Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility. Tonight's presentation is by Dr. Randall R. Odom. Dr. Odom is Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Chief of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at the Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. The title of his talk today is Female Infertility. I will now turn things over to Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, who will review the details of tonight's presentation. Thank you so much. Hello to everyone. I'm Jeffrey Hayes, the ASRM Education Specialist and Moderator for this webinar. Before beginning the webinar, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. To make sure we can cover all the content in the allotted time, all everyone's line except the speakers will be muted. We will devote time at the end of the presentation to questions. However, please feel free to type a question in the chat window at any time during the presentation. We will then read as many selected questions as possible to the presenter. If for some reason you need to step away from the presentation, please sign out and then sign back in upon your return. After the webinar is done, please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey for your continuing education credit. You must complete the post-test question successfully and complete the survey to receive credit and be able to print off your certificate. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Randall Odom. We're very excited for his talk this evening, so I will now turn things over to our speaker. Thank you, gentlemen. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, I'm going to be speaking tonight on female infertility. I believe there's a related talk that addresses male infertility. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. I, however, am a member of the ASRM practice committee, and so I did have significant input on a number of the practice guidelines that I will be discussing tonight. Starting with my objectives, at the conclusion of this presentation, I hope that everyone can clearly state their understanding of basic infertility facts, direct an appropriate evaluation of the infertile female, identify infertility testing that is no longer appropriate, counsel infertility patients about lifestyle issues, and lastly, I'm going to touch on a number of evidence-based papers that I hope together will allow people to make therapeutic decisions for infertility patients. So let me start with the case. And I'm just gonna go through the case here, but not discuss it until later, but let's say a 36-year-old woman with a 38-year-old husband has three and a half years of infertility, and she has widely spaced cycles that are about 34 to 39 days apart with significant dysmenorrhea. Her husband had an undescended testicle that was treated as a child, and they otherwise are reasonably healthy. Their goal is to have two children, and his job involves extensive travel. So ultimately, I think just using this case, I'd like us to be thinking about what would we do? How fast would we do it? Uh, do they have special needs that we need to meet, and how can we do that? And are their goals realistic? Now, I think a good place to start is to talk about the definition of infertility, and this guideline from the practice committee addresses definitions. And it's a short paper, but I think one that everybody should uh, should uh, pay attention to. So again, we think infertility is a disease and it's defined by 12 months or more of appropriate unprotected intercourse or therapeutic donor insemination without pregnancy. And of course, that is a somewhat age-driven disease, so the diagnosis of infertility is warranted after six months for women over age 35. And like most diseases, we typically would begin the workup when the disease is established, uh, but of course, earlier evaluation and treatment would be justified for a number of um, indications historically and on physical findings. So how prevalent is this? And you know, it's really kind of hard to get a good, accurate estimate on the, the prevalence of subfertility and infertility. And so I included a paper from Human Reproduction about a decade old, and this kind of gives a, a good picture of what happens as, as infer, 
infertile couples progress. So if you start out with, with a group of, of patients that are trying to get pregnant, and they do so for about six months. After six months, 80% should be pregnant. So there's going to be 20% that are not pregnant. And then as one goes, uh, the chance to conceive, uh, I don't know if my pointer is showing up, but over the, the next six cycles, half of these 20% will, will conceive. So at the end of one year, you would expect that 90% would have been successful, and we have 10% remaining after 12 cycles. So over the next three years, half of those 10% may spontaneously conceive. And so at the end of four years, 5% or 1 in 20 couples are, are still left without a pregnancy. And after that point, of course, spontaneous pregnancy can occur, but, but it becomes fairly uncommon. In fact, some would say rare. So I want to talk about workup. And I'd like to make the strong point that appropriate testing and workup is a very fluid process. And I think we have to be lifelong learners. And uh, I, I, think, I think back that when I was a fellow, the, the testing and the workup that we did, is it doesn't look at all like the workup that we do now. And uh, my dear mother uh, gave me this book that she found at a garage sale years ago. And it's Facts for Childless Couples. It was published uh, before I was born. Uh, but I, I find it interesting reading. And please note that in 1953, the workup for the woman included uh, basal metabolic rate, x-rays, a uh, hand x-rays, uh, some old school tests, the Rubens test. I found it interesting that they recommended an endometrial biopsy test in 1953, even though this antedated the, the dating criteria that led to biopsy for for over 50 years as part of our workup. Uh, but uh, this is not the recommended workup that I'm going to discuss for the balance of the talk. So we're going to look at how should we approach couples when they come in. And I know as fellows, people know this stuff, but I think it's important to review it. And so we see couples, and we really should do a pretty comprehensive history and exam. And we ought to talk to them about appropriate preconception issues, such as appropriate genetic screening. And then I think the message that we should pretend is that we want to give a systematic, expeditious, and cost-effective evaluation. So and we really want to do things that are least invasive, uh, and we have to take the patient as a whole person into account. So we want to look at their preferences and their age and how long have they been trying and what are their goals. And uh, I think that all has to be part of how we evaluate patients. So I think we want to do a little less cookbook and pay attention to who we're caring for. Uh, so as part of the female evaluation, I'm going to touch on four areas as listed here uh, in the order that they are listed. So we'll start out with ovulation. And this paper published out of Canada, uh, as you can see in 03, uh, it's a very nice study. And I, I don't think it really got the press that it deserved. Uh, they asked a simple question, does anovulation exist in eumenorrheic women? And they looked at a fairly large cohort of 550 women. And of those, 410 were eumenorrheic. And so they looked at these women and did a bunch of things, including measuring blood progesterone levels. And they initially felt that 15 out of the 410 appeared to be anovulatory. But when they dug deeper, they found that 12 of these 15 were actually ovulatory or there were other issues going on. Uh, so they were left with three patients of, of 410 that were consistently below 15 animals per liter, uh, which translated uh, into nanograms per mil uh, is, is kind of in the range, well, well, the patients were actually in the range of 9 to 13 animals per liter. And that translates to 2.8 to 4.1 nanograms per mil. So, you know, we would say if their progesterone level is above three that they ovulated. So at most, three out of 410 were possibly anovulatory. And there are very few tests that are 99% accurate. So this paper would say that if the patient is, has eumenorrhea, they are ovulating, and no workup to evaluate whether or not they are ovulating is necessary. So what 
do we do when we try to sort out if patients are ovulating? And there, there are a number of issues on this slide and the next. And I elected to just put a couple words in about the very old-fashioned basal body temperature graphs because patients still, it's uncommon, but some still will bring in these things. And it's important to note that it was a very low-cost qualitative retrospective device. It was accurate in 80% of patients, but accurate to plus or minus three days. So, you know, if you think of the fertility window as six days, uh, plus or minus three is six, and I don't know if it's going to hit that window or not, but it wasn't very good. Uh, it's certainly no longer the best of the preferred method, but I think it, the, the knowledge of it should still exist amongst people that do what we do. What about urinary LH monitoring? Well, I think it's, it's worthwhile if cycles are minimally irregular. Uh, a positive result precedes ovulation by one or two days, and in general, the kits would say that a midday or evening urine is best. Uh, unfortunately, these kits have a number of false positives and false negative results. If they could only be almost as good as the box that they come in says they are, but they, of course, we know they're not. And it's important to remember that this is an indirect evidence of ovulation. So if a patient says they have a surge, I tend to think, well, maybe that's what's going on, but I would not rely exclusively on that. And then other modalities we have, of course, is progesterone levels. And if you're going to do that, you'd want to draw it mid-luteal as best you can determine. And I would suggest that we figure out when we think they're ovulating and then determine your blood draw time rather than just saying to get it drawn on a fixed day, such as a day 21 progesterone. Um, so you want to time it to, to the appropriate uh, mid-luteal phase. And then a level greater than 3 nanograms per mil says they ovulated. And somewhere over the past 30 or 40 years, the idea has been propagated throughout our country that you didn't ovulate if your progesterone level is higher. And I've heard 8, I've heard 10, I've heard 20, I've heard 25. And so I think we have to remember that the right answer to that question is 3 nanograms per mil, and it's of above that they've ovulated. Now, uh, you know, what... Why did I say that? Well, remember the corpus luteum is pulsatile, and and uh, the the concentration has been shown in in good work that it can vary up to sevenfold within a few hours. So I think we have to we have to consult our patients that you know they either ovulated or they didn't. Now, and progesterone is of course relatively inexpensive. Now, what about ultrasound? So there are many things that we learn from ultrasound, and none of us could practice without it. And it obviously does a great job at telling us about numbers and sizes of follicles. Um, but, but, and there are presumptive findings associated with ovulation, but they're not definitive. And I think it's fair to say that ultrasound should never be the primary evaluation tool to make the diagnosis of whether or not someone is ovulating. I think that is a tremendous waste of resources. And I can remember many, many years ago where people would do serial ultrasounds in unmedicated cycles to see if somebody was ovulated. And, you know, uh, that's, that's just not right. So, uh, so I think the message here is if you're trying to figure out when somebody is ovulating, you probably want to revert back to the LH kits and use that. And if you want to simply clarify for peace of mind whether they did or not, get a blood level. Now, what about and ovulation. So, so you figure out if they're ovulating or not, and if they're not, then we got to think, why is that? And of course, there's many factors that influence that, like obesity and PCOS, and weight fluctuations and stress, and exercise, uh, lots of things. And uh, we have to be, you know, we have to figure out what tests are we going to do to figure out a specific treatment, what what do we need to do to screen these patients? And I would contend that it's not a lot. Uh, people that we think are anovulatory certainly should have a TSH and a prolactin level. Some, depending upon number of factors, may benefit from a 17-hydroxyprogesterone level. And then, of course, if they're amenorrheic, then one should consider FSH and estradiol levels to distinguish those that are either hi have hypothalamic amenorrhea or ovarian insufficiency, uh, but I, I think that that's where you can stop drawing blood. So other tests like PCOS bloods in the anovulatory patient 
if you really must know if they have PCOS for whatever reason you really must know, then you can start to draw their bloods. But if you're trying to get somebody pregnant and you want to know whether they're not ovulating and then get on with inducing ovulation, you don't need much. You need a TSH and a prolactin for most people, and you can move on after that testing. Now, to summarize ovulatory dysfunction, if they have regular cycles, if they're eumenorrheic, you don't really have to test anything. If they have somewhat irregular cycles that are reasonably spaced, uh, and you, you want to dig deeper, then you can use LH monitoring, and if they get a positive LH surge, draw progesterone level seven to nine days later. And if they have significant irregular cycles or they're amenorrheic, then of course we don't need testing to figure out whether or not they're ovulating. If they are ovulating every once in a while, we're still going to treat them. So if, if we know that they're anovulatory, then we can just move to the appropriate testing to sort out why that may be. And, and uh, I think we can go with, with our knowledge that they're not. So let's move to ovarian reserve issues. But I think that there is some confusion about this. So um, ovarian reserve is, of course, the reproductive potential as related to the number and quality of eggs. And decreased or diminished ovarian reserve, um, tend to think of that as reproductive age women with regular menses whose response to ovarian stimulation is lower than women of comparable age. So DOR, or de decreased ovarian response reserve, is not a diagnosis that automatically follows an abnormal laboratory test. It is a definition that reflects a lack of appropriate response. So, um, so I think it's fair to say that measures do not establish a diagnosis of DOR, but the, the, the blood test may help us uh, suspect it. So we use labs like what we will discuss in the next slide to predict responses. Uh, but again, a lab does not give you that diagnosis. So who are we going to test for ovarian reserve? Well, I think without question, women that are over 35 with greater than six months of infertility, in other words, 35 and above with infertility, warrants this testing just across the board. A lot of younger patients warrant it, though. And you know, I've listed on this slide those with early menopause, prior ovarian surgery, ovarian cystectomies, chemotherapy, unexplained infertility. And I think we're at a point now where people that are planning any type of IVF-related procedure almost always is buying their way into uh, some ovarian reserve screen. So what are the tools that we have? Well, we have kind of listed them here from oldest to newest. And uh, day three FSH and estradiol levels have been around for a long time. And uh, they're, you know, they're, they're useful, but like lots of things in medicine, we, we think they're really great until we figure out that they're not so great, and then we move on to the next thing that's going to be best for the next five years until we find something better. So how is an FSH and estradiol level? What, what, what should we remember about those? Well, in general, if you've got a high FSH level, it, it's pretty good at predicting a poor response. Um, but, you know, the problem with, with FSH and estradiols is that has relatively poor sensitivity for predicting who will respond poorly. So it misses you know, a lot of patients that have normal E2 FSHs that, that don't respond very well, and it just doesn't predict that very well. So FSHs can vary widely, and I think it's important to know that there is proof that the peak values are most predictive. So if you've got a high level last month, and the level's better this month, I wouldn't be excited that they're going to do better because they probably won't. Um, and then estradiols, of course, are, are drawn in tandem to aid the interpretation of FSH, but an estradiol that is elevated as a solitary finding is probably not as useful uh, as we might think it is. So antral follicle counts, I think they're very popular. Uh, they, of course, it, are determined by measuring all follicles uh, in both ovaries that measure between 2 and 10 millimeters. And to do this right, you should really do it when there are not other significant follicular structures present. And what is a low antral follicle count? Well, classically, value 6 or less has so, been associated with a poor response to stimulation in IVF. Um, 
but of course, like many of these tests, the low antropocal count does not reliably predict failure to conceive. I think it's a guidepost, just like other ovarian reserve screens. And then, of course, anti-malarian hormone levels have been around for a long time, but they had kind of a rocky course for for a long time because of a number of factors. Uh, but AMH is made by granulosa cells of small developing antral follicles. And, you know, the beauty is that you can draw it any day of the cycle. And, uh, you know, it's, it's originally, you know, we early on we thought it was not impacted by other things, but we do know it's impacted by exogenous meds and obesity and patients that are hypo-hypo. Uh, but we all believe that low levels are associated with a poor response. Uh, poor embryo quality and poor IVF outcomes. Uh, so the, these associations are worth noting and we use them to make decisions. Uh, but I think that there are a lot of things about all of this testing that we really don't have clear answers on. Like how is it that we have dramatic mismatches between them and how is it that they can be so poor on some occasions at predicting what really happens. So there's more to learn, but these are the tests we have at this point. So I think it's important to remember a few things about ovarian reserve. And one thing is when you have a screening test, it's, it's geared for an appropriate population. And if you do screening of low-risk populations, what do you get? You get false positive results. And so I'm a little you know, bothered by the fact that now we want to get AMH levels on everybody, and then you have 26-year-olds that are going through IVF that have an AMH that's low, and people don't know what to do with it. Uh, so these tests should not serve, no, no one of these tests should be a sole criteria to go straight to IVF. And of course, none of them are a reflection that pregnancy will be impossible. Uh, they, they, an abnormal brain reserve test is as it, as it stands alone, is not a reason to immediately go to some drastic measure. Uh, and then people have tried to play with combining these tests. And in general, most data would say that combined results of multiple screens has not really been shown to be better than any test individually. So let's move to pelvic anatomy evaluation. And I'll try and go through this somewhat quickly. But we want to know about how we're going to evaluate the uterus and the tubes and peritoneal factors. And of course, we have several things in our uh, armamentarium to, to differentiate here as listed. So let's talk about HSGs first. And an HSG is it's, it's the primary screen of tubes and cavity. It has been for a long time, and I think it will into the future. Uh, it's, it, offers us some features, a really well done HSG, you can document patency, you can look at SIN, it can do other things. It's not the best screen for pelvic adhesions or endometriosis, of course. Uh, and then it could be it can identify or make one aware of a uterine duplication, but it's not the test to define that. And uh, I think technique is crucial. Um, so here is a slide listing a few bullet points about technique and of course they should always be done early in the cycle. Menses should be completed. You don't want a blood clot still in the cavity because it will look like a filling defect. Uh, ruling out pregnancy is a really good idea. Uh, I am amazed that I hear that people don't rule out pregnancy before they do HSGs, which is kind of surprising in that the number of patients that bleed early in pregnancy. So I would, I would recommend ruling out pregnancy before you do this. And then be aware of antibiotic guidelines. And, the American College of OBGYN as well as the American College of Radiology both have published guidelines about antibiotic uh, prophylaxis, and they, they overlap somewhat. Obviously, ACOGs are proactive guidelines, and, and the ACRs are what do you do when you're the radiologist. And in general, our guidelines say that if you suspect you have a high index of suspicion for hydrocell pinks or prior PIT or something like that, you should give prophylaxis. Uh, but not everybody needs it. And the American College of Radiologists basically say if they see a hydrocell pinks at the time of HSG, they ask the patient about antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, and if it was not given, they would give it at that point. Uh, you should always have side labels. And this, you could say, well, how come the example I show in my slide doesn't have a side label? And I will say, because I had to cut this 
I made this slide a long time ago and I had to cut it down because it would not have been HIPAA compliant if you would have seen the R in the right side, but side labels are crucial and pull down images are crucial. So here's a very nice, you can see the the you know external eyes here, they've got to pull down so you can see the whole cavity. So you can say for sure here is the cavity. And you know that, and this is the last of many images. And if I see an HSG that comes with two or three images, I, I sometimes wonder whether the patient was charged for it. Uh, if you don't have at least seven images, I would say, are you really doing a good job at your HSG? Uh, so done well, it's very helpful. So here's a nice slide, and it's actually from a nice paper that you might want to take a look at. Uh, it was in Pertillian Australia about a decade ago. And it shows this patient who was fortunate enough to have two HSGs done on two consecutive days. And the first one was done in diagnosis, I think, tubal disease and fibroids within the cavity, which was a little surprising. And so this patient was offered another HSG the next day in which they pulled down and demonstrated a probable septate uterus with nice looking tubes. And, you know, I think it really nicely demonstrates that you have to have the proper access to evaluate the cavity and that you know good technique is invaluable when you're when you're doing an HSG. This paper I mentioned by the way is a, it's it's a really cool paper. Uh, I think it was a modern trends in ASRM and it has like probably 50 HSGs in it. It just really covers everything. So it's a it's a great reference. Um, so how accurate are HSGs? Well this is an old study. Um, it's like 1995, uh, but this is not the kind of study that's done often. And so in this study, they tried to compare patients that had both HSGs and laparoscopies with the goal being to see how accurate the HSG was based on the, the laparoscopic chromotubation findings. And they looked at, it was a meta-analysis where they looked at 20 studies that did that, so they had over 4,000 patients. And uh, they only included patients that had both studies. And what they found basically was that, it, you know, HSGs had relatively high specificity but lower sensitivity. Um, and I think part of the problem with this study is that they mandated that people had both and then there were a number of patients that would have been in the study, but they had normal HSGs, and then they got pregnant before they got their laparoscopy. And obviously, if they would have increased the number of normal HSG findings, they maybe would have changed the results here. But, but this paper says a normal result may have problems, but an abnormal HSG is probably abnormal. And I think we would all buy that. Uh, so, what about uterine cavity evaluation? Well, of course, ultrasound is better than HSG for pathology because it shows us more. And sonohistrographies have been shown in, you know, many studies to be superior for polyps and fibroids and, and synechiae. Uh, 3D ultrasound and pelvic MRIs are helpful. I think they should be used judiciously. And then hysteroscopy is, is you know, of course, labeled the gold, gold standard, even though it really can't differentiate certain things. It's, it's great in evaluating the cavity, but in most places, there are clear exceptions, but in most places, uh, due to cost and invasiveness, the hysteroscopy is the tool to fix it, not the tool to diagnose it. Um, so let me start of these techniques talking about sonohistrography, and of course, saline enhances visualization of, of the vaginal ultrasound, there are many benefits. Uh, it's important to schedule it in the same window as an HSG. Uh, the study I referenced here demonstrates that if you schedule it in the luteal phase, that you can anticipate a 27% positive, false positive uh, finding. Uh, so I would avoid that. And then, of course, you want to cover the entire cavity. Uh, there was an RCT done quite some time ago. Uh, that suggested that 2D and 3D were equal for intrauterine lesion workup. Uh, I wonder if that's still true, as it seems 3D is better than it used to be, but that's the data. And then there has also been clear data that says that if you're trying to differentiate a polyp on a 2D ultrasound, if you see blood flow to the polyp, that's as good as the sonohistrography at differentiating them. So I put an example in here of a sonohistrography just to show how nice it is. Uh, this obviously is a septum, and I think that it, it, it just very clearly shows that the fund is going across here, 
This study, I think, is about five or six years old, and uh, credit goes to Margaret, my ultrasound tech. She does good work, but I think you can clearly see the benefits of this, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, so I will move on. So, um, so what about the accuracy of these modalities? Well, this is kind of an amazing study that was done in 2000, where they had 65 women that underwent every one of these procedures. They had transvaginal ultrasound, a sonohysterography, an HSG, and a hysteroscopy. And they found that sonohysterography was the most accurate test. Uh, it was clearly better for polyps and hyperplasia. Uh, they felt that it had limited accuracy with adhesions similar to an HSG due to false positives. And uh, I feel a little cynical when I look at that, but I think that some people don't realize that adhesions go from the anterior to the posterior side of the uterus. They don't go horizontal, and that's how you get false positives. But I think if you know what the adhesions look like on a sonohistrography, you probably don't have very many false positives, but I'm just telling you what the paper said. And then, of course, sonohistrographies are best for uterine malformations, although this particular paper missed some unicornic uteri. Uh, but I would contend that that probably would not be the case if it was restudied at this time with improved ultrasound and with uh, 3D ultrasound. I think the unicorn uteruses are, should be pretty evident to people. Uh, and of course, hysteroscopy was reported to be the guideline, but it can't really define the duplications. But I think it, it served as the gold standard for polyps and, and uh, adhesions. So, Sonohistrography is good. Okay, well, what about peritoneal factors? Well, you know, uh, this slide is really about laparoscopy. Um, so we have, you know, we have kind of a changing face of laparoscopy in our subspecialty. Uh, you know, if you're looking for endometriosis, of course, ultrasound is great because you can sometimes see things that we can't fill on pelvic exam. And uh, there still is a role for laparoscopy. It's still clearly indicated in women that have symptoms that warrant it or with significant exam ultrasound or perhaps HSG findings. So I don't think we've abandoned our laparoscope. Um, but, but, it's, but it's far fewer numbers of women that qualify. So I think you might consider women with worrisome histories or some with unexplained infertility although the paper I'm going to present on the next slide would argue against that. So I think in the old days there was something known as a pre-IVF laparoscopy, uh, and that has hopefully died and gone away, but I think laparoscopy is rarely indicated if IVF is planned, unless of course you're going to take tubes out, uh, and there of course is still a role for surgery with advanced endometriosis. But I think the day of routine laparoscopy to look for possible asymptomatic endometriosis is, is gone. And uh, why is it gone? Well, it's, there's a number of reasons. This is one paper, I think maybe the best, uh, out of uh, New England Journal in 97. This is a multi-center study done in Canada. I think they had 10 centers. I'm not sure of that. Uh, but they, they basically took women uh, 340 women that had negative workups, and these women had no significant pain. These are not women that had severe dysmenorrhea. These were just women that just were not getting pregnant. And they agreed before they went to the OR to be randomized. And uh, when they went to the OR, if they were found to have endometriosis, then they were randomized there between diagnostic do-nothing laparoscopy or cautery to get rid of the endometriosis. And what they found was that those that had cautery did do better. Uh, they had statistically higher pregnancy rates. The curves were better. So I think if you are in that situation, this paper says, by all means, treat it. Uh, but this paper, more importantly, said, you take women like this to the OR, 30% will, uh, you know, have endometriosis. And when you ultimately do the math and look at how much better the women that were treated did than those that were not treated, the calculation comes out that you have to do 40 laparoscopies on these kind of patients to get one more pregnancy. And I think few of us would sign up for a 2.5% success rate or laparoscopy. So I think you know this this is pretty much gone or should be. 
Okay, so we've talked about the female side of the work. We talked about ovulation and ovarian reserve screening and, and you know, anatomy and and uh, you know now we're kind of done with the workup. You know what do we do? Uh, and for the rest of the talk, I'd like to talk about a little bit first about what we should not do, and then talk about some lifestyle advice, and then we're going to talk about papers, uh, papers that everyone during this talk should know about. So choosing wisely is something that I think is kind of interesting reading. And for those of you that have not seen it, uh, if you're bored to death with my talk, you can go on your laptop and you can Google choosing wisely and you can learn all about it. But it's it's out there and what's interesting is that every specialty has been asked to write uh, items for choosing wisely in ASRM. Uh, we have now written 10 things that uh, physicians and patients should question. And of the 10 that we wrote, uh, six of them, not surprisingly, deal with infertility and I've listed them here and you can see there these are all things that have been done in the past and some are sadly still done now and these are all things that really are not part of the routine infertility workup and should go away uh, number one as we just discussed uh, diagnostic laparoscopy should be you know is not part of the routine workup uh, post cold testing I took all my slides out about postcoital testing because it should be gone, but uh, there are some people still doing that. It's not part of the routine workup. Uh, thrombophilia testing on patients undergoing a routine infertility evaluation. It's hard to understand why this still happens, but it does. Uh, immunologic testing is part of the routine infertility evaluation. It is not part of this evaluation. There is good data to support why it should not be. Uh, we used to do a lot of endometrial biopsies, and of course, there is good data to suggest that that is not helpful in, in regards to timing and dating endometrium. It, of course, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do a biopsy if you're afraid that your patient has hyperplasia or something else, but for the routine infertility workup, it's not a part. And then I think the thing that is probably the most in need of changing is that prolactin testing should go away. There is no reason to perform a prolactin level as part of the routine infertility evaluation in women that have regular menses. It's just not proven to be helpful. So these are things that we should not do to complement the things that I said we should do. So let's talk about some general counseling and lifestyle things. So timing is everything when you want to get pregnant. Uh, that's probably true whether you're trying to get there or not get there. But anyway, classically we think, based on a paper that was very nice, and I didn't reference here, but uh, it, it, you know, we all think the fertility window is about six days. And the door shuts closed uh, on the fertility window the day that ovulation takes place. And you know, when the paper that suggested that first came out, I think a lot of people were surprised, but if you think about it in the setting of IVF, if you take the eggs out today, they're not going to fertilize tomorrow. Uh, so, you know, it either it's the party is over once ovulation takes place. And so six days with the last day of ovulation is the window. Uh, two days before is optimal. Uh, and so, you know, we all tend to say, you know, patients want to know how often they should have intercourse. And, you know, the data suggests that every other day is probably, I mean, that's the advice I think most people give. But to be honest, um, if you look at the data, more often is even better. Uh, it's more stressful. It's not a lot better, but it's better. Uh, now, what about identifying the window of, of uh, you know, uh, the fertility window? And, you know, there, there are lots of things to do, and, and you know, patients still do BBT graphs, and that, of course, will not help you identify the window prospectively. LH kits are probably the most often, uh, but you know, there are a number of patients that use this mucus methodology, and you know, it's it it is something that I think a lot of us are not very fond of, uh, but there is actually um, reasonable paper uh, papers, I believe. It's, that show that checking cervical mucus is as good or better at predicting the day of conception than the other modalities as in BBT or LH. Uh, you know, positioned and resting doesn't matter. 
uh, lubricants I think people make a big deal about. They probably are not really all that important or an impediment if they use the long rubric, wrong lubricant, but of course, if patients need it, we probably are still compelled to recommend those I've listed on this slide. Now, um, what about lifestyle factors, other things? And, you know, I, I think we need to all be good about remembering this stuff and, and have some, some numbers to, to quote people. So what about obesity? Well, pretty good data that BMI above 35, time to conception increased twofold. What about underweight? BMI under 19, time to conception increased fourfold. How many people think about that? We spend a lot of time trying to tell our patients with BMIs over 35 to lose weight. Do we spend as much time telling our patients with a BMI of 18 to try to gain weight? Uh, I know it doesn't work. Uh, I think that's why we don't try to do it. But at least we should bear in mind that it has clearly been shown to be a factor. Uh, smoking, uh, smoking is, you know, is a big deal. Um, there is a paper that says smoking may account for as much as 13% of infertility. And smokers need nearly twice the number of IVF attempts to conceive as non-smokers. I mean, it's a big deal. And so the relative risk of infertility has increased 60% for those that smoke and for those that drink more than two drinks per day. Uh, it's also increased for those who have, ex uh, you know, fecundity has decreased for excessive caffeine consumption. And then there is data about illicit drugs and toxins as well. Um, I'm not terribly familiar with that data, but uh, it's here. Now, let's talk for the next, hopefully I don't know how much time I have, but I'm, I want to go through about six or seven papers quickly. So most of these papers were written by the Reproductive Medicine Network. And, uh, you know, I think the first one that came out that was really the big, first big paper like this came out in 1999, and I've summarized it on this slide. And this study uh, looked at 900 plus couples, uh, and they went through normal workups. They went through workups, 1990s style workup. So they, of course, would have had things like postcoital tests and endometrial biopsies back then. Uh, and then they were included in this study if they had any motile sperm, and that's a really important thing to note because some of these people had really bad sperm because any motile sperm got them in the door. And then they broke up into four groups and their pregnancy rates per cycle are shown here. And they're, as you can see, they're pretty bad. Uh, and they did something called intracervical insemination. And most people listening to this lecture probably say like, what is that? Uh, but in the past, people used to do this and they put the sperm into the cervix, not into the uterine cavity. Um, and uh, so they so they looked at patients that had just intracervical insemination, just IUI, a superovulation with intracervical and superovulation with intrauterine insemination. And you know, it's not very surprising that the superovulation was three times more likely um, than the intracervical, the superovulation IUI, and of course, superovulation IUI was better than just IUI alone. But if you look at these rates, it really wasn't very good. And then if you look further, you'll see that in the entire paper, they had 932 couples, but they had 186 pregnancies, 134 live births, a lot of multiples, seven higher order gestations, uh, 18 twins, six patients hospitalized for OHSS. And so they concluded that superovulation and IUI was an effective option. Uh, but I think we all look back, I look back at this paper and I go, oh my God, we really have to start it to do things differently. And I think we should be happy and glad, but this is how we learn. So this was a paper that kind of did away with, with intracervical insemination and showed that superovulation worked better. But again, the rates are really lower than we're used to seeing because of the um, inclusion of guys with really low sperm as part of their database. So let's move ahead uh, about, I don't know, eight years or so. And this was one of the first um, Reproductive Medicine Network papers that looked at PCOS. And if we go back into time in 2000, 2003, 2005, 
metformin was given out by candy and people use it. We thought metformin was the best thing in the world and uh, lots of people were using it. So there's a big study that looked at clomiphene, metformin, or both for infertility in patients with PCOS. And uh, the, um, the, the, the PCOS definition was basically kind of the one that uh, old guys like myself still believe in, that they have to have few cycles and hyperandrogenemia. And so they, they had that definition they treated these patients up to six cycles and for 30 weeks, and this is what they got. And these, the, the rates in this table, bear in mind, these are not per cycle rates. These are live birth rates for, for going through the whole process. And you can see that uh, they had, uh, in clomiphene alone, 22.5, three times better than metformin and the combined was about the same as clomiphene. So this is metformin plus clomiphene. Uh, they had no multiple gestations in the metformin group, which is great. Uh, the clomid was 6% clomiphene alone and 3.1% with metformin. And then the, this paper really identified something that's kind of interesting, that if you look at pregnancy rates per ovulatory subject, so they took out the people that didn't ovulate. And just look at the people that did ovulate. And you can see that it was 39.5 for clomiphene. It was 46% for clomiphene and metformin together, but it was only 22% for metformin. So it's, it's interesting. This paper really kind of demonstrated that you cannot rely on ovulation as a surrogate for live birth rates because all these people ovulated, but these people got pregnant at a much better rate. And I think that uh, the message there is that, you know, clomiphene probably caused multiple follicles and it raised the multiple rate, but it also raised the, the chances of one getting pregnant if they ovulated. So, uh, and of course, this paper, there were a lot of follow-up papers after this came out. And remember, there was a throwaway that had uh, a tombstone with metformin written on it and stuff like that. So metformin has not died entirely, but its popularity certainly plummeted with this paper, um, which is good because it suggests that people are paying attention. Uh, so let's look at the next study that, that I've, I've chosen, and this happened three years later, and this was not a reproductive medicine network study, but it's, it was a good study, and, and the lead author uh, is, of course, the the head of our association, or uh, of ASRM, uh, Dr. Ryan Dollar. In this paper, the FAST trial, uh, randomized clinical trial to evaluate optimal treatment for unexplained infertility. So what did they do? Well, this was a, an RCT of 500 couples, and it was women that were 21 to 39, and they had unexplained infertility, and then they were divided in into kind of the conventional treatment that we were all doing in 2000 and 2005 and around then. And the conventional treatment, um, let me explain this in a little bit of detail, but they, they had clomiphene IUI and how those patients did it is that they got 100 milligrams of clomiphene for five days, days three to seven, and then they had them look for evidence of ovulation with an LH surge kit, and then when they got a surge, they did IUI the next day. Now, if they did not see a surge by day 15, they would do ultrasound, and then they'd give them HCG if they saw a follicle over 18 millimeters in size. That was the clomiphene group. The FSH group was 150 international units of FSH to start, and then they would adjust it based on monitoring, and they would give HCG if they saw a follicle 17 or greater, along with two or three follicles that were at least 15, and then they do IUI 36 hours after HCG. And then IVF um, was done with a long agonist protocol. They started with uh, 10 uh, microliters of, of Lupron and reduced to five, and their FSH starting dose was 225, and it was adjusted, and they gave HCG with a lead of 17 and at least three follicles over 15. So those were kind of their cookbook recipes. So. The conventional treatment, they did clomiphene IUI three cycles, and if they were not pregnant, then they did FSH IUI for three cycles, and then they went to IVF. And they did IVF for up to six cycles, although typically that would be 
four fresh cycles and two frozen cycles would be a typical six cycle regimen. So the conventional arm of the study was that, and the accelerated treatment arm, they skipped FSH IUI. They just did three cycles of clomiphene and then they went to IVF. And they studied the time to pregnancy and the cost effectiveness in pregnancies that led to a live born baby. So what they found was, you can see they had equal groups, about 250 patients in each group, and who got the most babies? Well, the accelerated group got 171, and the conventional got 150. Uh, who got pregnant quickest? Well, the conventional group took 11 months, and the accelerated group took eight months. And then, of course, who got, um, you know, who paid the most in the accelerated group was about 10 grand cheaper based on observed charges for delivery. So the pregnancy rates per cycle, if we look at the different treatments, were 7.6 for clomiphene IUI, uh, 9.8 for FSH IUI, and 30.7 for IVF. So uh, clearly the accelerated treatment of three cycles clomiphene and then IUI saved money and resulted in a greater proportion of couples with a live-born baby. So this paper really says FSH IUI, no added value. Uh, in fact, it's added cost, added time, you know, and I think this was, this was a great paper at pointing out, you know, the, the path we should be taking. So this is a good paper to know about. Now, um, it's kind of a serial paper to the FAST trial is the, four, uh, the 40 trial. And this is a randomized clinical trial to determine optimal fertility treatment in older couples. It said the 40 and over treatment trial, although it wasn't really 40 and over patients, it was patients between 38 and 42. And this paper was published about two years ago. And they had three arms in this randomized trial, 154 couples, so about 50 per arm. And they treated patients with six months of unexplained infertility. And basically in this paper, um, they, they got two cycles of clomiphene IUI or they got two cycles of um, FSH IUI, or they did IVF. And uh, the, the doses of, of what they did, clomiphene IUI was very similar to the, the FAST trial. Uh, the FSH was 300 of IUs of FSH to start, not 150. And the IVF was OCPs for three weeks, and then they used a microdose Lupron trial and started out patients on 300 of FSH in, in the morning and uh, 150 of HMG in the evening. So it was more aggressive IVF, more aggressive FSH IUI. Um, and same thing with, with IVF, uh, it would be a mixture of, of uh, fresh and frozen. So, so basically, everybody got two cycles of what they were randomized to. But then if you weren't pregnant, then everybody went to IVF. But the main outcome was clinical pregnancy rate after two cycles of treatment. And what they find in the 40 study results, well, they found clinical pregnancy rates, as you can see, uh, clearly highest. At, this is up to two cycles. And you can see IVF almost 50%, uh, clomiphene 22%, interestingly, FSH below clomiphene at 17%. Uh, the birth rates uh, for two cycles were about 16 versus 13 and a half versus 31. I mean, these are live birth rates. Um, and, uh, you know, the total number of cycles needed for live birth, you can see it's equal here, much less here. And you can see in the clomiphene and IUI, or in FSH IUI patients, the vast majority of patients in both groups. Um, that most of the pregnancies came when they flipped to IVF. So clearly the most successful treatment is immediate IVF. Uh, and I think a, a clear message here is success rates for clomiphene IUI and FSH IUI, they're very similar. So if you're not going to start these patients directly with IVF, then um, I think you should do clomiphene with IUI and not gonadotropins with IUI. It's, it's just impossible to justify the resources to do something that has been shown now in two large, nicely well-designed studies to be uh, non-additive. Um, so uh, getting back to the Reproductive Medicine Network, uh, 
they did a nice paper follow-up. So here's another PCOS paper, letrozole versus clomiphene. So we proved that clomiphene was better than metformin in their paper in 07. Seven years later, they came back, largely the same group, large double-blind randomized trial of 750 women, uh, 18 to 40 with PCOS, and they these this study was 50 milligrams letrozole. I'm sorry, 50 milligrams clomiphene, or 2.5 milligrams of letrozole, and they would do up to five cycles. And they basically would take the med, measure progesterone level. If it was less than three nanograms, uh, then they would bump the dose. So they would go from 50 to 100 to 150, or in the case of letrozole, 2.5, working up to 7.5, and and Basically, progesterone levels were their, were their gold standard using three as ovulation. These, these patients uh, did not use LH kits. They did not do IUI. I know it's a teaching moment for fellows to point out that it is possible to get pregnant without IUI. Uh, and then um, their primary outcome was live birth. And here's their results. Uh, you can see that the uh, Electrozole was superior to clomiphene. Uh, the cumulative live birth rate, 27.5 versus 19. The pregnancy loss rate's pretty similar. The ovulation rate, higher in electrozole than in clomiphene. Uh, electrozole did appear to have more major congenital anomalies, but you know, it wasn't statistically significant. And the anomalies were very diverse, so that we don't really think that there was any common mechanism uh, between them. Uh, and then the twin rates are, as shown, 7 and 4 percent, fairly similar. Uh, but this study concluded that letrozole was superior to clomiphene as treatment for anovulation in PCOS women. And I think we should all remember this, and I think this has made letrozole, despite its off-label use, become the drug of choice for this population. So one last Reproductive Medicine Network paper. This is the letrozole gonadotropin or clomiphene for unexplained infertility. Michael Diamond was lead author of this paper published last year. And this was another large RCT, 900 couples. Um, again, same age group, 18 to 40, with unexplained infertility. And they had three groups here. They had an HMG group. They had a clomiphene group. They had a letrozole group. And um, in this paper, they um, they blinded that the patients that were on pills did not know which pill they were taking. So um, they, you know, obviously couldn't blind the shots. And they were treated up to four cycles. And the primary outcome was kind of confusing in the study. It was the rate of multiple gestation among women uh, with positive fetal heart motion. Uh, so it's kind of a kind of a different primary outcome. And the, and the primary outcome, furthermore, was analyzed as letrozole versus the others. So, you know, not the typical primary outcome you would expect from a study like this, but it's what they designed. So, and their results are shown here, and you can see, of course, that, you know, HMG was the highest. Uh, letrozole led to significantly reduced rates of ongoing clinical pregnancies and live births. Uh, but surprisingly, it didn't lead to a reduced incidence of multiple gestation. I think this was really kind of a surprising thing. In fact, uh, the other studies, you remember, it's like 3%, 3.9%. Now we have letrozole at 13.4, uh, actually a little bit higher than clomiphene. Um, and, um, you know, letrozole kind of came out not doing as well as we expected. So uh, what did they learn from this? Well. We learned that um, the letrozole versus human menopausal gonadotropins, of course, we had a lower rate of live births and multiples. However, the rates of the two outcomes between letrozole and clomiphene were really not different. They look different. 28.3 versus 22.4 looks different. Live birth rates of 23 versus 19. Technically, they were not significantly different, but I think what's happened from this paper is that people have said, whoa, we're not going to do HMG because the multiple gestation rate is too high, uh, so we're going to pick between one of the other drugs, and clomiphene appears to be better for this indication, and so that has been kind of the, the probably the conclusion that most people have taken from this. Now, just, I think, one more paper. And, uh, I just threw this in because there's been a lot of controversy about subclinical hypothyroidism over the past 
five years or whatever. So uh, the, the PC from ASRM wrote this paper last year and just wanted to touch on it. So subclinical hypothyroidism, we that's of course defined as a TSH above the normal range with the normal 3T4. The upper limit of TSH in the first trimester is generally felt to be 2.5. And of course, the, the big excitement is, well, what about the woman with the TSH above 2.5 that's trying to get pregnant? Well, there is no evidence that treating a TSH between 2.5 and 4 improves pregnancy rates or lowers miscarriage rates. However, there is evidence that if one has subclinical hypothyroidism with the TSH greater than 4, there is fair evidence uh, that treating with levothyroxine to get the TSH below 2.5 can improve pregnancy rates and decrease miscarriage rates. Now, let me point out that it's fair evidence. It's not overwhelming evidence. Uh, so I, I would have a hard time faulting somebody that failed to treat uh, subclinical hypothyroidism, but I think it makes sense to treat that. It doesn't make sense to try to chase after the TSH of 3.1 and lower that down. Uh, I think that's not supported by the literature. So this is the guideline of our society. Uh, now, let's go back to the patient. Um, we've been talking an hour. Um, I, I guess I get to keep going, or Andy will cut me off. Anyway, let's look at this patient, OK? Um, she's 36, 38-year-old husband and read the case before. What are we going to do? How fast do we do it? Uh, how do we meet their needs? What should we do? And I'll try and go quickly since I've gone long. But of course, we want to review preconception counseling issues for them. We're going to do an exam. We're going to do the basic tests, semen analysis, FSH, AMH, TSH. I would get all of those things on this patient. And I would do it somewhat expeditiously. Uh, this couple may need to do stuff like bank sperm if the guy is out of the country all the time, and we'd want to offer that. But I think if the testing is normal in this 36-year-old woman, uh, I would go straight to treatment. And since she's age 36, I would follow the, the data in the FAST trial, and I would say she could do up to three cycles of clomiphene IUI, and if clomiphene IUI didn't work, then I think she should consider IVF. And of course, if there's problems with sperm or tubes or anything, then of course, all bets are off and they have to be more aggressive. So are their goals realistic? Um, you know, I think if, if we are appropriate and realistic and go ahead with treatment at age 36, and, and if you remember the data from the FAST trial, what kind of pregnancy rates you get and what the timeline is, um, you know, you should be able to establish for most people in that age group a pregnancy in less than one year, uh, and then that brings them back in at 38 plus, and you know, it's it's certainly possible that they could get another pregnancy out of that. Uh, so, in summary, uh, what do we do? We do a careful history, and we talk about genetics and appropriate lifestyle modifications. We go through uh, an expeditious, cost-effective workup. We uh, you know, make decisions for people based on their age and their goals. And uh, I think we need to stay current uh, with what's appropriate to do diagnostic-wise and therapeutic-wise. And, uh, you know, um, I, I think most importantly at the end, we need to be thoughtful, honest, and ethical. Uh, you know, our, our patients rely upon us, and uh, we owe it to them uh, to do what we think is the right thing. So. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Um, so there. So, thank you, Dr. Odom, for an excellent and comprehensive treatment of female infertility. We have uh, two questions, if you don't mind taking the time. Um, we do have two, ans uh, two questions that have come in through the chat room. Um, and the first one, uh, one of our listeners, um, asks, what role, if any, does endometrial receptivity play in female infertility uh, and fertility treatment? And should one test for it? Um, I, I think in the routine infertility evaluation, such as I was tasked to discuss, um, I, I don't think that that is part of the routine process. And then if we look at at the data that's out there, I mean, there, there 
of course, are a number of different modalities that have been proposed, uh, different substances that can be checked for. And uh, I guess I'd, I'd, I feel like I'm not sure I want to go into that <laughs> in this context. So I, I would say, you know, endometrial receptivity is probably not part of a routine infertility evaluation, but there may be a role for it uh, in, in selected instances. Thank you. We have a, another question from a listener who says, you mentioned that anti-malarian hormone, AMH, um, can be an indicator of diminished ovarian reserve. Does the predictive value of AMH change at all with the age of the female? Uh, I think that we have to put age and AMH levels together. Um, you know, I think what gets really confusing with the AMH levels in, in older patients, I assume they're asking about older patients here, is that there are occasionally older patients that have higher AMH levels and we think, oh, they're going to respond really well, and of course then they don't. And I think that's one of the examples that I was alluding to uh, when I said that I think there's some things here that we don't have figured out. Uh, I think most people are looking at AMH levels and they're they're treating them almost like shirt sizes, like they're either small, medium, or large. And so if the AMH level is low, and uh, I remember a series of papers in, in our journal, I forget how long ago, maybe two or three years ago, where they asked a number of different people what a low AMH level was, and we found that we got lots of different answers. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think if a low AMH level, it's going to drive us to be more aggressive. And that's probably particularly true in an older patient. Um, and, and, and as we see higher AMH levels, it's, it, it may drive us towards a different protocol if we're doing in vitro. It may tamper what we do, which medicines we do. So I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but I, th I think, you know, we probably pay, most people pay more attention to it as patients get older, probably because we're more focused on concern of ovarian reserve issues at that age. Thank you. You're welcome. And, okay. and with that, we'll uh, close tonight's session. Uh, thank you for attending tonight's presentation. Please do not forget to return to ASRM eLearn to take the post-test and complete the survey to receive CME credit. Join us for our next live webinar on Wednesday, April the 20th at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time with Dr. Mark Sigmund, who will present on the topic of male infertility. Uh, registration uh, for that event is currently uh, going on and can be found over at ASRM eLearn. Uh, my thanks again to our speaker this evening. My thanks to uh, everybody uh, in attendance. This webinar is now ended.